At its core, in its current iteration, the Republican Party is offering a fascist theocracy ruled by white heterosexual Christian men. This is a party that just doesn't oppose abortion. At its core, the Republican Party opposes abortion, even in cases of rape and incest. While at the same time, the Republican Party believes in child marriages. I'm not making this up. Child marriages where a 40-year-old man can marry a 14-year-old girl. Child marriage is legal in 40 states. 20 of those states don't require any minimum age. All you need is the consent from one parent. This is enslavement, where a girl in America never knows any man other than the adult male she now calls her husband. This is the Republican Party. We see a push now to eliminate no-fault divorce. Conservatives want to go back to when a man had to give a woman a divorce. Otherwise, she couldn't pick up and leave no matter how abusive the relationship was. I saw this in conservative commentator Stephen Crowder's divorce, where he complained openly that he didn't want the divorce, but his wife did. And he said until Texas gets rid of no-fault divorces, there was nothing he could do. Now, before no-fault divorces... In order for a woman to leave an abusive husband, she either had to kill him or herself. This is the Republican Party. This is a party that wants to eliminate contraception so women are pregnant all the time. And they want to eliminate the idea of marital rape. Up until the late 70s, in some states, there was no such thing as marital rape. This is a party, the Republican Party at its core. It believes women are unhappy working for a living because they should be home raising children. And if a woman doesn't bring children into this world, then they are useless. That's who the Republicans are at their core. They believe women are second class citizens and they believe that the root of America's decline is women in the workplace. Consequently, any woman who votes Republican is an idiot. And even more importantly, all female Republicans who serve in Congress are bat shit, crazy, and stupid. Case in point, Colorado Congresswoman Lauren Boebert and Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, they're both stupid, which means they're Republicans. They are loud and proud about their idiocy. They love their guns and Jesus and have openly said that America is a white Christian nation. They believe in Christian family values, even though last year Marjorie Taylor Greene's husband filed for divorce because Marjorie wouldn't stop banging all the gym rats down to the strip mall health spa. Google it. And this year, Lauren Boebert and her husband announced they're getting a divorce because Lauren Boebert wouldn't stop sleeping with the guys at their restaurant. Google it. And Mr. Bobert was drinking and uh, showing his penis to minors in a bowling alley. Google it. So you would think two idiots like Bobert and Green would get along. But like Bobert, Green and the entire Republican Party, you would be wrong. Turns out Bobert and Green are territorial. They compete to out stupid the other. And it all blew up on the House floor Wednesday when Marjorie Taylor Greene called Lauren Boebert, quote, a little bitch in front of other Republican lawmakers. They all confirmed the uh, this modern day Lincoln Douglas debate 
if uh, Douglas was missing parts of his brain and uh, Abe Lincoln had already been shot. This is the the big debate between Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene caught on C-SPAN on Wednesday. And it ended with Marjorie Taylor Greene calling Lauren Boebert a little bitch. See, Lauren Boebert introduced her own articles of impeachment to remove Joe Biden from office. And that incensed Marjorie Taylor Greene. She accused I'm not making this up. She accused Lauren Boebert of plagiarism, of copying and pasting her articles of impeachment, taking all the credit, not giving Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, any credit. And she said to Lauren Boebert, why do you have to steal my idea? It was my idea to impeach Joe Biden. Why couldn't you just co-sponsor my articles of impeachment? Why did you have to steal mine and claim they're, they were your own, you little bitch? That is the, the fight between Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, a meeting of the minds. Well, it doesn't end there. Another stupid female Republican decided to get in the middle of all this. Her name is Anna Paulina Luna, and she's stupid. Did I mention she's stupid? She's a female Republican congresswoman from Florida, and she's stupid. She's also a liar who sometimes claims she's Jewish. Sometimes she says she's Mexican. Other times she says she's Arab or even German, depending on who's hiring that day. Oh, yeah. And her grandfather was a Nazi. Did I mention she's stupid? She's a Republican. She claims to have come from a poor family. That's a lie. She's a stupid liar. She claimed to have been traumatized by a home invasion that never happened. And when her uncle uncle challenged all her lies, she went ahead and accused him of stalking her. She went out and got a restraining order. She's stupid. Did I mention that? And manipulative. So whose side do you think she's on? Is she on Marjorie Taylor Greene's side or Lauren Boebert's side? If you said she's on Marjorie Taylor Greene's side, you couldn't be wronger than Anna Paulina Luna's mother for not aborting her. Anna Paulina Luna is on the side of Lauren Boebert's. And, you know, she had to get involved. Here's what she tweeted. The only bitch I see is Marjorie Taylor Greene in both definitions because she is a dog. Marjorie Taylor Greene is Speaker McCarthy's lap dog. Marjorie Taylor Greene is jealous that someone actually walked the walk instead of just talking. Marjorie Taylor Greene has been promising articles of impeachment against Biden for almost three years. Now she's jealous because Lauren Boebert actually took action instead of using it as a fundraising grift like Marjorie Taylor Greene does on a daily basis. Wow. That's that's uh, these are Republican women, all stupid and petty. Did I mention they're stupid? Besides being stupid, Congressman. Luna introduced legislation to censure the brilliant Adam Schiff, who's running for Senate in California. He's still a congressman. She introduced legislation to censure Adam Schiff for the lies he spread about Russian collusion. In 2019, to refresh your memory, Congressman Adam Schiff became chairman of the House Intelligence Committee And he began looking into the role Vladimir Putin played in assisting Donald Trump in winning the 2016 presidential election. Adam Schiff was also an impeachment manager and Trump hates Schiff. Donald Trump seen here practicing for prison. I call him Mr. President. He endorsed Congressman Luna. She's from Florida. I call her Congressman Lunatic. And to thank Mr. Prisodent for the endorsement, she introduced the motion to censure Adam Schiff 
as well as fine him $16 million for spreading lies about Russian collusion. You know, Trump is so stupid, he probably thought if Schiff pays the $16 million fine, Trump gets it, right? That's how stupid uh, Donald Trump is. Anyway, the motion to censure was defeated last week. But this week, Congressman Lunatic reintroduced the motion to censure and she removed the fine, no fine. And so because nothing else needs attention in Washington, everything's just hunky dory. Congress was forced to debate whether or not to censure Adam Schiff for, quote unquote, spreading falsehoods about the role Putin played in the 2016 presidential election. Now, let me just refresh your memory about uh, Russiagate and collusion. You have to be a citizen of America to donate to a candidate. Foreign countries are forbidden from meddling in our elections, even though we do it all the time in other countries. It's still illegal for a another country, a foreign country to meddle in our elections. It is against the law to take money from foreigners if you're running for office. And it is against the law to take what are called donations in kind donations in kind. I'll explain what a donation in kind is in a second. You're not allowed to take a donation in kind from a foreign government. What is a donation in kind? It's a gift. It's free work. A donation in kind is information, secrets on your opponents. It's against the law to take information about your opponents from a foreign government. That is considered a donation in kind. The Republican-controlled Senate Intelligence Committee investigated Paul Manafort's dealings with Russia during the 2016 campaign. Paul Manafort was Donald Trump's campaign manager. He attended the meeting at Trump Tower in the summer of 2016 with Russian operatives who were offering to give dirt to Trump about Hillary, okay? I think it was Senator Burr, who the Republican who chaired the Republican-controlled Senate Intelligence Committee, and they investigated Paul Manafort's dealings with Russia during the 2016 campaign, and a Republican-controlled Senate Intelligence Committee concluded that Paul Manafort, Donald Trump's campaign manager in 2016, quote, represented a grave counterintelligence threat by creating opportunities for Russian intelligence services to exert influence over and acquire confidential information on the Trump campaign. There is no question that the Trump campaign was soliciting and being solicited by Russian oligarchs and Russian intelligence agencies for dirt, for assistance during the 2016 presidential campaign. That's a fact. That's indisputable. And it's illegal. It's illegal. Here is newly elected congressman, Democrat, former prosecutor Dan Goldman, Wednesday during the debate on whether or not to censure Adam Schiff. Here is former prosecutor Dan Goldman explaining why there's no doubt that the Trump campaign broke hundreds of laws dealing with Russian government officials and Russian oligarchs. Remember, this motion to censure Adam Schiff is based on accusing him of lying about Russian collusion, right? Here is Dan Goldman just talking about Paul Manafort. There are hundreds of examples, but here is Dan Goldman talking about Trump's campaign manager, Paul Manafort. You want to talk about collusion? 
Let me ask my Republican colleagues, if a campaign manager for a campaign is giving internal information to a Russian intelligence agent, is that collusion? Because that was the once classified information that is now public and now constitutes collusion. And there are so many other issues. Yeah, Paul Manafort was giving information to uh, to Russian operatives uh, for another show. So as the debate over whether to censure Adam Schiff continued, Congressman Adam Schiff, who is running for Dianne Feinstein's seat in California. And this, I think, might be good for him. This might help him. As the debate over whether or not to censure Adam Schiff continued Wednesday, Adam Schiff took to the floor to defend himself. This is a remarkable speech, and I'm going to play it in its entirety. This is uh, Congressman Adam Schiff. To my Republican colleagues who introduced this resolution, I thank you. You honor me with your enmity. You flatter me with this falsehood. You who are the authors of a big lie about the last election must condemn the truth tellers and I stand proudly before you. Your words tell me that I have been effective in the defense of our democracy and I am grateful. And yet this false and defamatory resolution comes at a considerable cost to the country and to the Congress. At a moment when millions of people in our home state of California are unable to find a place to live or afford a place to live, Speaker McCarthy chooses to occupy the resources of Congress for two straight weeks on this hollow sop to the MAGA crowd. He offers nothing to those who are homeless or addicted to opioids or to millions of college students mired in debt but this paltry distraction. Donald Trump is under indictment for actions that jeopardize our national security, and McCarthy would spend the nation's time on petty political payback, thinking he can censure or fine Trump's opposition into submission. But I will not yield. Not one inch. The cost to the Speaker's delinquency is high. But the cost to Congress of this frivolous and yet dangerous resolution may be even higher as it represents another serious abuse of power. Donald Trump has threatened that any of you that defy him and vote against this partisan resolution will be met by a primary challenge. And he calls for my imprisonment. If a transient majority can punish and attempt to silence members who hold a corrupt president to account, there is no telling what further corruption of office will follow. And I say this to Speaker McCarthy and others who wish to gratify Donald Trump with this act of subservience or bend to his demands. Try as you might to expel me from Congress or silence me with a $16 million fine, you will not succeed. You might as well make it $160 million. You will never deter me from doing my duty. Well, the race for Senate in California just got really interesting. As you all know, Dianne Feinstein will not be running for re-election in 2024. And there are three California Congress people who are running in the primary and uh, they want her seat. It's Adam Schiff, Katie Porter, who we've had on this show, and Barbara Lee, who I've endorsed. Barbara Lee, I think, shows the best judgment because she voted not only against the war authorization for Iraq, she was the only Congress person to vote against the war authorization for Afghanistan. And I don't want to get into it now. Watch my previous shows. She was right. And the rest of the Congress was wrong because the Taliban did not attack us. Afghanistan did not attack us on 9-11. Katie Porter is new to Congress. She's great. Adam Schiff, as Howie Klein has pointed out, is moving to the left, but he's, you know, a bit of a, a centrist in some respects. For example, he voted for both the war authorization in Iraq and Afghanistan. Nancy Pelosi did not vote for the war authorization in Iraq. She had supreme judgment on that. Adam Schiff lacked the judgment. I mean, that's a major mistake. 
to have voted for the war authorization in Iraq. So I I want Barbara Lee. However, uh, he's been censured and he's been turned into a scapegoat. Uh, here's the vote. Here is here is Speaker Kevin McCarthy announcing the, this ridiculous motion to censure Adam Schiff for for, quote, spreading falsehoods about Russian collusion. Here's Speaker McCarthy. The yeas are 213 and the nays are 209, with six answering present. The resolution adopted. Without objection, the motion to consider is laid on the table. House will be in order. And the Democrats shouted shame for a couple of minutes. And then finally, when it died down, Speaker McCarthy continued. By its adoption of House Resolution 521, the House has resolved that the House of... I have all night. That's what he told Marjorie Taylor Greene also. By its adoption of House Resolution 521, the House has resolved that the House of Representatives censures Adam Schiff, representative of the 30th Congressional District of California, for misleading the American public. And for, and for conduct unbecoming of an elected member of the House of Representatives, the representative Adam Schiff will be forthwith present himself in the well of the House of Representatives for the pronouncement of censure. That representative Adam Schiff will be censured with the public reading of this resolution by the Speaker. And that the Committee on Ethics shall conduct an investigation to representative Adam Schiff's falsehoods, misrepresentations, and abuse of sensitive information. That is really shameful that Speaker McCarthy would endorse a censure of Adam Schiff. This is how we end up with a fascist theocracy. You go along, you go along, you do, you carry Donald Trump's water. This was all to get revenge. Trump hates Adam Schiff because Adam Schiff was the impeachment manager and he wouldn't let up on the House Intelligence Committee. Uh, and Adam Schiff is very smart. And Trump is stupid. Kevin McCarthy is stupid. They hate Adam Schiff for being so smart. Leave a comment. What do you? What, 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 I don't vote in California. Do but do you vote for Adam Schiff now? Uh, he was censured. He was officially censured. This is what they did to Joe McCarthy in the Senate. The, the, uh, Andrew Jackson, President Andrew Jackson, was censured. Uh, then it was over to, a couple of years later, they voted to rescind the censure. But what do you do if you live in California and you're a Democrat? Do you vote for Barbara Lee, who I think deserves to be in the Senate? Or do you vote for Adam Schiff, who, I don't know, he's he's kind of been turned into a hero. What do you do? I'd be curious to know what you think. So please leave a comment. I read all your comments. Well, Speaker Kevin McCarthy timed the vote. This was all on Wednesday. He timed the vote to censure Adam Schiff, Schiff so it would coincide with testimony from former special counsel John Durham, who was hired by then Attorney General Bill Barr. Remember Bill Barr? He was Donald Trump's attorney general. And to placate Donald Trump, Bill Barr hired John Durham, appointed him a special counsel to look into the origins of Crossfire Hurricane. Crossfire Hurricane. That is what the FBI called their investigation back in 2016 into Donald Trump's ties to Russian intelligence officials, as well as Russian oligarchs. This was this begun when Obama was president. They noticed that 
members of the Trump campaign were meeting with Russian operatives. So the FBI launched an investigation titled Crossfire Hurricane. And Trump thought it was unfair. Bill Barr, he enables this behavior. So he appointed a special counsel, John H. Durham, to look into why the FBI investigated the Trump campaign during the 2016 presidential campaign. I know it's hard to keep track of all this. That's why it's so easy for them to lie. Because it's just, there's so many players. It's so easy to lie. Uh, Durham issued his final report last month on May 15th. It took him three and a half years. And Durham issued his final report on the FBI and the investigation into Russian collusion known as Crossfire Hurricane. And he concluded that the FBI shouldn't have launched a full-scale investigation into Trump's ties to Russia. He concluded they should have only launched a preliminary investigation. That was it. After three and a half years trying to prove that the FBI was biased against Trump, that there's this deep, dark state at work trying to destroy Donald Trump, all he could do was accuse the FBI of confirmation bias and say that they were politically motivated in finding dirt on Trump, although he couldn't prosecute anybody. He failed at that. And his conclusion that the FBI was politically biased against Donald Trump runs counter to the Justice Department's Inspector General's report, which was released in December of 2019. And that it was Inspector General Horowitz, I believe was his name. Uh, he exonerated the FBI. Now, who are you going to trust? The inspector generals are neutral. They, they're, they're like the Congressional Budget Office. You can trust the inspector generals. Uh, and the inspector general of the Justice Department exonerated the FBI in 2019 and said that they were well justified in looking into Russian involvement with the Trump campaign in 2016. The truth is John H. Durham, the special counselor, is the one with confirmation bias. He found absolutely nothing. He found absolutely no nothing. Well, actually, that's not true. He was on the road with Bill Barr, Attorney General Bill Barr, in 2019. They went to Italy and they met with... Uh, Two times they met with Italian intelligence agents trying to uncover FBI corruption. And the Italian intelligence agency offered Bill Barr and John H. Durham uh, some dirt. But it was dirt on Trump. They, they said, we have some more dirt for you if you're looking for any on, on Donald Trump. And Barr reportedly said, that's not why we're here. We're, we're not looking for, so you can keep the dirt. The Durham investigation, three and a half years, ended up with nothing. He put two people on trial and failed to win a single conviction. So he got it from both sides on Wednesday. He went before the House Judiciary Committee, chaired by the wonderful Jim Jordan. And this was supposed to be the day that Durham spilled the beans and exposed the FBI, but he got it from both sides. Here is Matt Gates, Republican, grilling Durham uh, when Durham testified before the House Judiciary Committee, basically called him the equivalent of the Washington generals in a game with the Harlem Globetrotters. That's what Matt Gates just called him a a loser. Here's Matt Gates. You tried two cases, lost both of them, and then the one plea, guilty plea you got, Kleinsmith, Kleinsmith is back to practicing law in Washington, D.C. today. Yeah, that's beyond my control. Right, but, but the, f the fact that you allowed that plea to occur, right, and, and then the punishment was insufficient, the fact that you didn't, you didn't charge Andrew McCabe, 
You didn't convict the lying Democrats or the lying Russians. You didn't investigate Mifsud or the Mueller probe, even though, as we sit here today in black letter, that was your charge. So there's a lot of shorthand there. Klein Smith uh, pleaded guilty last summer to altering an email for an application to spy on Donald Trump's campaign advisor, Carter Page, when the FBI was launching its uh, initial investigation back in 2016. So he got Klein Smith, who I think was an attorney for the FBI. He got Klein Smith to admit that he fudged an email so a judge would authorize some uh, uh, wiretaps, I believe, on Carter Page. Well, that's bad, right? It's bad. And uh, Joseph Mifsud is that Maltese professor. It's not a Maltese dog. He's uh, from Malta. And he allegedly told Trump's former campaign aide, George Papadopoulos, in the summer of 2016, that the Kremlin was in possession of thousands of emails that revealed dirt about Hillary Clinton that could help Trump's campaign. And when the FBI found out that Papadopoulos had been informed by Mifsud, that kick-started the investigation. And there's some question as to who Joseph Mifsud is and why he knew that the Kremlin was in possession of thousands of emails that revealed uh, dirt on Hillary. Well, anyway, you're not supposed to keep track of all this. Don't worry. But here, here is why Adam Schiff was censured on Wednesday. You gotta, you gotta go for the, the brilliant one. You gotta, here's Adam Schiff, the same day he was censured. Here he is grilling Durham, exposing Durham as a partisan hack. He's exposing Durham as a Republican hack who set out to prove there was no Russian collusion, but he failed. He couldn't prove there was no Russian collusion. Here is Adam Schiff. He is brilliant. Adam Schiff is brilliant. Here he is grilling John Durham about Don Jr., who's not brilliant. Don Jr., if you remember, he agreed to meet with Russian intelligence officials in the summer of 2016 for dirt on Hillary. That, that big meeting at Trump Tower, it's clearly illegal, right? The email, Don writes, if Don Jr. says, if, if what you're saying is true, I'm all in. Watch Durham dismiss the meeting at Trump Tower as nothing. And he thinks he's going to get away with this. Uh, and he doesn't. That Don Jr. was informed that a Russian official was offering the Trump campaign, quote, very high level and sensitive information, unquote, that would be incriminating of Hillary Clinton was part of, quote, Russia and its government support of Mr. Trump. Are you aware of that? Sure. People get phone calls all the time from uh, individuals who claim to have information like that. Really, the son of a presidential get candidate gets calls all the time from a foreign government offering dirt on their opponent? opponent. Is that what you're saying? I don't think this is unique in your experience. Uh, so you uh, you have other instances of the Russian government offering dirt on uh, a presidential candidate to the presidential candidate's son. Is that what you're saying? Would you repeat the question? <laughs> can you repeat the question so I can have more time trying to figure out how to lie without being charged with perjury? This is Durham giving away the entire game. I know it's confusing. I know it. It's hard to keep all this, uh, keep remember all the pieces here. But this is Durham giving away the whole Republican game. He cavalierly dismisses the meeting in Trump Tower in 2016 as though presidential campaigns entertain offers from Russian intelligence officials, you know, for dirt on their opponents. He, he cavalry like this happens all the time. It's commonplace. We all know he's like saying we all know that everybody, every presidential campaign meets with Russian intelligence agents for dirt on their opponents uh, here. 
the, here's Adam Schiff uh, humiliating this political hack, this arrogant prick political hack, John Durham. This is why Adam Schiff had to be censured later that day. Uh, you said that it's not uncommon to get offers of help from a hostile foreign government, a presidential campaign directed at the president's son. You really stand by that, Mr. Durham? I'm saying that it, that people can make phone calls um, making uh, claims uh, all the time that you may have experienced. Are you really trying to diminish the significance of what happened here and the secret meeting that the president's set, son set up in Trump Tower to receive that incriminating Information you're trying to diminish the significance of that, Mr. Turner? I'm not trying to diminish it at all, but I think the more complete story is that they met and it was a ruse and they didn't talk about Mrs. Clinton. Uh, and, and you think it's insignificant that he had a secret meeting with the Russian delegation for the purpose of getting dirt on Hillary Clinton and the only disappointment to express that meeting was that the dirt they got wasn't better. You don't think that's significant? I don't think that that was a well-advised thing to do. Oh, no. oh, not, not well-advised. Not well advised. He's this guy, John Durham, is so accustomed to talking to idiots and projecting his own stupidity onto people who aren't idiots. And this is this is Adam Schiff. I'm going to continue to play this. This is I just wanted to stop it for a second. He's so Durham says, I don't think it's well advised for uh, presidential campaigns to meet with Russian operatives. It's not well advised. Is it legal? Is it legal? You're the special counsel hired by former Attorney General Bill Barr, and you call the meeting, quote, not well advised. How about legal? If those Russian intelligence agents, even if they turned out to be FBI agents, and this was a sting operation, Everyone from the Trump campaign who attended that meeting could have been convicted, right? Honeypots, we do that all, the, the FBI does that all the time. If you engage in illegal activity, it's illegal. It doesn't matter if you bear no fruits from that illegal activity. He's saying, well, they, they took the meeting, but the, there was no real dirt on Hillary. Doesn't matter, they took the meeting. If you rob a bank and there's no money in the bank, you're still guilty of robbing a bank. But this partisan hack, John Durham, calls it ill-advised. Ill-advised. Here's Adam Schiff once again demonstrating why he had to be censured later that day. Here he is responding to Durham. Durham called the meeting in Trump Tower ill-advised as opposed to illegal. Got the first half right, not ill-advised, illegal. Here is Adam Schiff asking the special counsel, is it legal? All right. Well, that's that's the understatement of the year. So you think it's perfectly appropriate or or maybe just ill-advised for a presidential campaign to secretly meet with a Russian delegation to get dirt on their opponent? You would merely say that's inadvisable? Yeah, if you're asking me what I do, it I don't. I hope I wouldn't do it, but it's, it was not illegal. Uh, it was it was stupid, foolish, ill-advised. Well, it, it is illegal to conspire to get uh, incriminating opposition research from a hostile government that is of financial value to a campaign. Wouldn't that violate campaign laws? I don't know. I don't know all those facts to be true. I don't know all those facts to be true. Game set match. I don't know all those facts to be true. Facts are true. I don't know all those facts to be true. You just said they're facts. So that means they're true. It is against the law for presidential campaigns to take money from foreign governments and foreign citizens. It is against the law to meet with representatives of a foreign intelligence agency for dirt on your opponent. It is against the law to meet with FBI agents posing as foreign intelligent intelligence agents. If it was a sting operation, it would still be against the law. Doesn't matter if you bear no fruits from the meeting. If a foreign intelligence agency has dirt on your opponent, 
They are meddling in our elections. Your job, Donald Trump Jr.'s job was to immediately alert the FEC and say Russia is meddling in our elections by meeting with them. Instead, you're an accessory after the fact. By taking that information, you are committing numerous crimes. By saying you want the information, you are committing numerous crimes, one of which is an illegal campaign donation in kind, right? Dirt is worth money. You pay for dirt. Getting dirt for free is accepting a campaign donation in kind because it's worth a lot of money, and that's illegal. But John Durham says he doesn't know these facts to be true. I don't know these facts to be true. Durham is a partisan hack who worked for the Justice Department back in 2005, up until about 2010, and he proved he was willing to play ball with the Republicans. When the CIA had videotapes of their own agents back in 2005, violating international law, torturing suspected members of Al-Qaeda. This was in a black site in Thailand. There were tapes of our CIA torturing Al-Qaeda suspects. Well, what did the CIA do? They destroyed the tapes. I think it was Gina Haspel. I'm not sure. I think she destroyed the tapes and uh, Trump rewarded her by making her head of the CIA. I think I'm not positive. But, you know, you get rewarded for covering up for the CIA. The Justice Department, this came out. The House Intelligence Committee found out in 2005. The uh, 9-11 Commission wanted to see those tapes and the CIA wouldn't hand them over, and it turns out they erased them. So the Justice Department was forced, the Republican Justice Department under war criminal George W. Bush was forced to uh, launch an investigation, and they assigned it to this guy, this partisan hack, this arrogant prick who assumes everybody's as stupid as he is, John Durham, and, you know, he jerked around for a couple of years. And then I think it was 2010 to maybe 2011. He decided not to prosecute, proving himself to be a loyal Republican foot soldier. He covered up for the CIA. So Bill Barr, the attorney general under Trump, knew to hire him to cover up for Trump. You don't move ahead by being a good person. You move ahead by covering up for other criminals. I think Gina Haspel was running the CIA uh, dark site in Thailand, and her reward for destroying those tapes was being made head of the CIA. I think I'll have to check that. It's been a year since Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito wrote the majority opinion that overturned Roe v. Wade. ProPublica reports this week that Alito was treated to a free fishing vacation to Alaska, all paid for by hedge fund billionaire Paul Singer. Alito stayed in a $1,000 a night hotel and flew on a private jet that had he been forced to pay for it, would have cost him about $100,000 for the fuel, the pilot, the use of the jet. Now, Alito broke the law, according to ProPublica. He broke the law because he failed to report the trips when it was time to make his annual financial disclosures. And this is in direct violation of federal law, which says Supreme Court justices must report all gifts. Why? Well, you know, in case uh, some, they have to rule uh, on a trial that involves the person giving you the, uh, the gifts. Well, after the trip, uh, the, the billionaire, the hedge fund billionaire, Paul Singer, went before the Supreme Court, not once, not twice, 
not three times, more, more than 10 times. The guy who paid for Samuel Lito's fishing trip that, you know, at least $150,000 had more than 10 cases before the Supreme Court runs a big hedge fund, right? So there are a lot of cases before the Supreme Court and Alito failed to recuse himself. One case before the court was resolved in Singer's favor, where the court ruled that the nation of Argentina had to pay the hedge fund billionaire $2.4 billion. And like I said, Alito did not recuse himself from that case. That would be uh, Justice Alito. He wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, explaining why it was perfectly legal. I won't even dignify what he said. The search for the submersible vehicle containing five people who crawled the ocean floor 700 miles off the coast of Boston to view the wreckage of the Titanic has... The, uh, the search for these people has increased exponentially with 10 ships circling an area of the Atlantic about the size of Connecticut. Several remotely operated vehicles are scouring the bottom of the ocean floor. The Royal Canadian Air Force is searching from the skies. The U.S. Navy is deploying a deep sea salvage operation, which is expected to arrive by Friday. The submersible went silent on Sunday, and although sounds are being detected, by most estimates, they should be out of oxygen within hours. On board are passengers who paid $250,000 each, including one passenger who is reportedly a Pakistani billionaire. Your tax dollars at work. So we're going to fight. Paul Provenza is, I love Paul Provenza. I love you too, David Feldman. And I agree with you. I think we should bring back the draft. And I'll tell you why. It's a little bit different than your theory. My reason, reasoning for it is that when everybody in America might have to pay the price for a war, like the ultimate price for war, send their kids off to this fucking war, then all of a sudden things change in terms in terms of how much people are, are into this war. You've met my <laughs> kids. Do you really think that would happen with me? What? I'd be a hawk with my kids. Well, okay, good for you. That's the whole point. <laughs> Everybody gets involved. Instead, it's all happening. See, here's the thing. Remember in the 60s, that big poster, uh, uh, um, you know, what if they gave a war and nobody came? Yeah. Well, that, that could happen now. If people chose not to, you know, not to enlist, that could actually happen. And the reason it doesn't is because there's all, all sorts of manipulations and corruption and, and what have you. But the military right now is really just a, uh, a uh, an occupation choice for a lot of people. As you know, it's overwhelmingly lower income. It's overwhelmingly uh, um, people who are, uh, you know, concerned about their financial futures. There's all I mean, when if you've ever spoken to any recruiter, it's all about how this is like a great career choice for you. But if everybody were subject, if they sent everybody to Iraq and every citizen, every household had to deal with the fact that their kid might have to go over there, they might have felt very differently about supporting right. that. Board. Right. By the way, not I think that's huge. I think I, I think not having a draft gives them carte blanche because they'll convince anybody to join up eventually. And in fact, in, in recent years, they've actually lowered the standard and started taking people with felony convictions and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I mean, we know that they're desperate for for enlistees because it's a shit deal all around for everybody. Right. Except the, the contractors or the JAG yeah, office. Yeah, that's the other thing, too, is if you're going to join the military, you may as well you know, start working for BlackRock. Right. Or Blackwater. All this week. What? Or, or whatever that company is right. called. This one. Right, right. By the way, JAG officers should not wear the uniform. 
if you're a lawyer and you're opportunistic like Ron DeSantis and you want to take a little time out of Yale Law School or Harvard Law School to burnish your credentials, you don't get to wear the uniform being a JAG officer. Right. I have no I have no opinion on that, but I just like the phrase JAG officer. I just like that. Jag off. That was my nickname. <laughs> I know. Th- throughout my second marriage. <laughs> Everybody calls you that. So let's talk about this big shoe that you're doing on Saturday. Is it June 10th? June 17th. A week from June 10th, I yes. believe, if we the math is correct. <laughs> so you're right. doing an episode of Green Room. It's a well, pay-per-view. Yeah. yeah, it's a. Uh, yeah, I'm doing the green room at my uh, at my house. I've been doing shows from here and streaming them online on Nowhere Comedy, and um, there are all different kinds of shows. But this one's going to be a, a, a live green room show with uh, some very esteemed guests. They're going to do a little stand up first, and then we're going to have a chat about some really dark subjects. Well, what do they all have in common? Uh, most of them, most of the people on the show, where the lineup is Henry Phillips, uh, Christine Levine, Annie Letterman, Andy Andrus, and the great Doug Stanhope. Uh, and aside from Stanhope and possibly Henry Phillips, they've all been abused and they do comedy about, about having been abused. That's how they've chosen to deal with it. And uh, I've been working on a documentary about Andy Andrus who, with the help of Doug Stanhope, went and confronted his childhood molester. And uh, and they confronted him on tape. And so I've been doing a documentary about that. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, about all that and about how, you know, certain people can make comedy out of it and other people's lives are destroyed. And what's the difference? How does that happen? And what, you know, right. just to, to talk about different paradigms, you know, now, of how people deal with, with these really awful, awful things. I mean, it destroys lives. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. What kind of laughs can you get? What what kind of laughs are you allowed to get? Well, we're going to find out. (laughs) Well, you're doing a documentary where this comic uh, confronts the, 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 was it a man? The way, you know, the way he deals with it is, is by, you know, trying to be as funny as possible about it. And that's sort of the through line through this whole story is how, you know, it screwed him up in life. It made him, it, you know, made him really self-destructive. It, it, it sent him down some spiraling paths that were not good for anybody, uh, himself included. And um, uh, as he started to get a handle on it all, he found that being funny about it really helped him deal with it. And and then he resolved it by by saying, all I want to do is sit down and talk to the guy. I want to say, what you think, and, you know, and, and confront him and, and what have you. And he does that. And then and there's a little surprise twist where the guy ends up suing them. So the story takes a lot of twists and turns. And it's the guy basically. sues him for the can. Yeah. He wants the candy back. <laughs> he wants the candy back. And he said, get out of the van. <laughs> what? How does he get to sue the, the kid he molested? That- uh, first, uh, one of the, one of the things was an injunction against because Andy told him I'm shooting this. You know, he pointed to the cameras and um, and the guy stayed for like another 20 minutes. Um, but then he got in touch with lawyers and uh, tried to get an injunction against them doing anything with the footage. So they had to go to court and defend themselves. That they have every right to use this footage. And in the process of all of that, the guy ends up, you know, crucifying himself. Right. The guy ends up being the judge ends up in, in this case about you know, voiding this injunction, uh, uh, the guy ends up putting into the record every one of Andy's accusations against him. So he screwed himself. Wow. He f- must have felt violated. Well, that's the whole And Andy said, if I had lost that case, it would have been like he touched me all over again. Right. Right. That, which is what they say about why women, why people don't go to the cops. Because right. it's right. just you're, you're violated all over again. Is forgiveness possible? You know, I, I, it's too difficult for me to read and talk about the, the woman who's forgiven Roman Polanski and was photographed with him. Uh, well, what kind of forgiving are we talking about? What are we, are, we, are we talking about, you know, 
the religious ideal of forgiveness? Or are we talking about, I forgive you just so I could go on in my life without having to hate you? Or, you know, it's like forgiveness is sort of a vague term to me. Right. I don't know. I mean, I, somebody said, I don't know who, my sister quoted this person who said, life is a constant lesson in forgiveness. That if you don't forgive yourself and others, it's really hard to survive. I suppose uh, that's true. I mean, you, I, I, I don't know if this is true for you, but certainly I beat myself up all the time. You know, uh, things where I've let myself down or my inner voice is telling me, dude, that was wrong. You know, right. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm worse on me than anybody else is. So I, that's certainly true, I think. See, I keep an enemies list. You are on an enemies list. I'm on an enemies list. I was thinking, you know, I do to-do lists. And they keep so I go, OK, this is out of my head and on the to do list. I know tomorrow I have to do boom, 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 boom. And it's on the yellow legal pad so I don't have to have it swirling in my brain and it frees me up. And I was thinking, suppose I had an enemies list. Suppose I wrote down everybody who I hated. We'd have to chop down a lot of trees for that. It would have to be a call list or a kill list. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to uh, just have a list of all the people who uh, have harmed you throughout your life? And I don't I don't even know if I, you know, I don't even think I hate that many people. Yeah, my list is very short. Yeah, I would say it's like 5,000, 5,000 tops. I'll tell you how I justify this list. It's because I had a conversation with a friend of mine who was always trashing people that I talked about who were like friends of mine. Mm -hmm. And I said, please don't, please don't do that. I mean, they're friends of mine. If they were saying things about you, I would, I would feel right. the same way. So, you know, keep it to yourself. It's not, it's not anything that's useful to me or, or, you know, or helps anything in any way, shape or form. It's just you expressing your negativity about it. And so we had a conversation about, okay, who can she? trash like that and so that became my list my enemies list and it's really only like four or five people on it mm -hmm. it's not been you know live this long right and how many of our enemies are just people we're jealous of <laughs> that's you know now you're getting into the weeds here yeah exactly is, is gossip immoral now here's the thing i when i became a stand-up comic i thought i was going to be a household name i thought i was gonna be famous so i did this posture where i said don't gossip because I'm going to be famous one day and I'll be the subject of gossip. So I would tell my friends, don't gossip. But it was really my way of signaling I'm about to become very famous. Well, I never well, became think famous. Of the think of all the gossiping you missed out on. I know. Like, I feel cheated. Turns out, turns out you could have had free reign. I, I don't know. I don't know shit. I, I would always like you know, get self-righteous and leave a room when there was gossip. I didn't get the reward. Exactly. Well, you know, that's the thing about the thing about gossip is it all boils down to uh, the golden rule, which is really what all religion should be. That's this is it. This is just one rule. That's it. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you don't like being gossiped about, don't gossip about others. Right. If, if you gossip about others, expect that other people will gossip about you. It's really a simple very simple thing, and I don't understand why more people don't live their lives right. just simply by that rule. It's that simple. Chelsea, you screw somebody over in business. Do you want to get screwed over in business? No, then don't screw that person over in business. It's a very simple ethic, and it's shocking to me that that it's uh, taken such a back seat to some sort of draconian religious ideas and moralities right. like that. But it's really quite simple. Is there anything that somebody could tell you about someone that in this day and age would shock you? Like Chelsea. In this day and age, I don't think so. I read today <laughs> Chelsea Handler. Mostly, mostly it would be people that, where, where shit, shit is shocking just because, like, you know, you can't really think of your grandma doing that. And it's shocking to even imagine. Right. This. It doesn't even matter what it is. It's just kind of shocking that she could get out of a chair and do this. You right. Know? Right. 
What were you going to say about Chelsea Handler? I, I was reading this morning that she was in a relationship with Ted Harbert, who was the head of NBC at the time. Oh, yeah. And she was on E! And he talked her into a threesome with another girl. On she, E! Not on E! Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and I guess she ended up falling in love with the girl... Oh, nice. And I'm, I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, well, this is salacious. This is gossip. Ted Harbert, you know, who roots for Ted Harbert? He's, you know, a, a network TV executive. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, this, good. She's humiliating him. And then I'm thinking, what? Uh, he was dating Chelsea Handler. He had a threesome. And Chelsea, like, who cares? Like, how is that humiliating or embarrassing? It's not at all. Not That's at all. Right. That's an example of you being jealous right there. Well, I don't know about that, but I'm, I was thinking, is there anything she could have told me about Ted Harbert that he would not want us to know? Listen, I think most, you know, I don't know where we have this notion that anybody is anything other than, you know, filled with salaciousness in their lives. I, I mean, it's life. There's right. nobody who is perfect and there's nobody who is a hundred percent decent and there's nobody who also you know doesn't have desires and lusts and and you know and all that shit so so no nothing really surprises me humans are fucking nuts humans are humans are nuts yeah we're nuts it's when somebody's not nuts (laughs) that i'm kind of shocked i don't know what to do with that humans are uh i thought as i got older i would figure them out but i find them more of a <clears throat> a mystery, and I find myself more of a mystery. I keep thinking I got myself figured out, and then I see what sets me off, <laughs> and I go like, "Why am I thinking about this? Like, why can't I, I stop thinking about this?" I, I think by some very basic indices, I think we have to conclude that you know the human species is among the most idiotic on the planet. Why would we destroy so much of our lives? The way we do. I just don't think uh, I don't think it's necessarily the uh, smartest way to evolve. It's never been as pronounced. We've always been this way, but now it's being splayed out in front of us. And those who are enlightened can just watch the slow motion car wreck and, you know, turn on Fox or, or listen to Jim Jordan and you go, Oh, my God, this it's like this is like a bad movie. Like this is like Adam. You know, it's like Don't Look Up. This is like this is it's like they've they watched Don't Look Up and said, oh, I want to be like uh, Meryl Streep. (laughs) I I just don't I don't feel like that in terms of a species that doesn't seem like a very productive evolutionary stage. No, no. But I listen, but I'm a real nihilist in these terms. I, I, I really feel like I don't care what happens to the species. You know, I don't have kids. Maybe that affects the way I perceive things. But I, I frankly think who would be alive right now and go, hey, this is a great time to have children. But aside from that. Well, it's never uh, been a great time to have kids. That's that's uh, why people get pregnant by accident. Uh, um, it's nobody it's, it's says. Perfect. Has it never been a good time to have kids? I don't know. I think, I think. When I Gorbachev, think I, had, I mean, we're watching, we're watching the planet, you know, shake us off like a bad case of fleas right now. This seems particularly a bad time. Yeah. 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 It's. Uh, but is it? Will we look back and say. We, we didn't know how good we have it. Not because, you know, we're, we'll be flooded out, but is it conceivable that there's an element of narcissism here, that everything we experience has to be either the best or the worst? Is it conceivable that this is just the way things have always been? I mean, what's the difference between the forest fires in Canada and World War II? The smoke and the evacuations i mean are well let's just use the temperature of the ocean let's just use that 
Yeah, not, not, but not the same as it's always been in human lifetimes. But at least the ocean isn't filled with U two boats. <laughs> U boats. What were they called? U uh, boats. U boats. Yeah. U boats. Unter Wasser. They were, they were the original uh, YouTube, uh, actually. By the way, I'm sure, I'm sure it is. What? Filled with submarines with all sorts of nuclear warheads on them. Trying to kill us. I, I'm just saying that, you know, there's probably just as many submarines out there as there were in World War II, now with nuclear warheads, and also, you know, swimming through plastic. Right. And chemicals that are in everything. So when you when when the really you you deal with the rich and the powerful, when Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk get together, do they really like talk as friends and say we got to get out of here, like we have to build a rocket to Mars? And I don't know, but there's a lot of people buying uh, buying properties and uh, and and pre built uh, shelters in uh, New Zealand right now. Peter Thiel. There's one. Yeah. Yeah. Would but you that's what was so great about the movie Don't Look Up. The ending was so fantastic. Yeah. Where they get to that other planet and then boom, all for naught. Yeah. I love it. Great <laughs> movie. The problem I'm big on apocalypse. I like apocalypse. I like, <laughs> I'm down with all of those movies about apocalypse. Uh, but, and I feel like it's we, we deserve it. I say, you know what? I don't care if the species disappears. I don't care. We would be one of millions in the course of the lifetime of the planet that have come and gone. And I say, let's give some chimps a chance. But give them a shot. What, <laughs> what would what do you think is our greatest contribution, humans? Nothing, nothing. It's all meaningless. It's nothing. We've done nothing. What We've about that? Nothing. We made it's it to the moon. Planet. We walked on the moon. Yeah, yeah. And we left trash. We did leave trash. <laughs> That's what we, more do you need to know? But in all seriousness, we can't fly, but we made it to the moon. Look, there's, you know, there's, there's no question that, again, by any number of indices, this the, hum, humanity is much better off than it was 100 years ago, 200 years ago, in, in terms of, you know, so many things. Um, pornography is never it's a golden age pornography is who knew the checks were going to come from behind like that <laughs> <laughs> they practically run it now <laughs> and the Czechs and the russians they uh, they own pornography now if you could live i'll give you 30 years any period in american history 30 years what would you take and where hmm Mm. 30 years, uh, 1910 to 1940 in Hollywood. Pretty good time to be alive. Uh, Working in silent movies, making the transition to the whole to, World War One thing. Yeah, probably not terrible. But, you know, that's where the beginning of uh, destroying the world uh, begins to happen. All right. Right after the war from 1945 to 1975, except for Korea and Vietnam. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> it's a great time to be an American. <laughs> I know what you're getting at. Things are always shitty. Yeah. No, no, I'm but, just trying um, to figure out what, when was it. But, but I do think it was though. a great time to be alive. I think if you <laughs> if you were a white heterosexual man who came back from World War II without post-traumatic stress syndrome, which nobody talked well, uh, about. There's a lot of qualifiers here, but yeah, I guess I suppose that that sort of is, that's why there are so many people who believe we should, uh, you know, have a higher tax rate because that's when the middle class boomed. That's when, you know, we had a, a tremendous. No, no, this, no. Uh, we need to destroy Japan and Germany, France and England again. Keep the ta lower taxes and destroy. That was what was so great about 50s. England, France, Germany and Japan were rubble. You got you got it wrong about the taxes. Most of Europe was rubble. Yeah. Just turn Europe to rubble and keep taxes low. That's my plan as your next president. 
Well, I'll get behind that. That's <laughs> make that's America great again. For my taste. I'll get behind <laughs> Do you really think it was because we raised taxes that our economy was so good? We raised taxes and we had unbelievable social programs getting people in, into univer- you know, colleges and, and, and homes and all of that sort of stuff. And, uh, and it exploded. I mean, it was also, you know, our industry became this, you know, these behemoths and all that sort of stuff. I suppose it was a perfect storm for, uh, for a middle class to develop. I mean... Also, my father, my father came home from my father came home from World War II and he knew how to operate weapons. And you got to make people like that happy. You had a lot of guys. And when you learned how to operate a weapon, you were operating something mechanical and that could translate to auto work or machine work or engineering. Right. Right. Now. Uh, you know, now now it's uh, you're just learning which buttons to push. Yeah. So I don't know that that's the same either. Right. It's not good. Not good, David. Not None good. Of this. Who's not good? F- who's funny? Well, you know, we're going to have this fucking we're going to have this refugee crisis, you know, in the next 10, 20 years, 30 years, at the, you know, at the, at the most, I think we're just going to have people, you know, moving from the southern hemisphere all over the rest of the planet. Right. And you, know, you think immigration is an issue now? Wait. Right. We, we already have we have climate refugees right in Canada. Thousands, sure. tens of that's thousands. Right. And, that's really, and that's really just a microcosm of what's going to happen with the rest of the world. Right. Right. And the reaction yeah. that I saw to the smoke, it reminded me of 9-11. I'm being serious here. I remember what, just sitting in front of the television on 9-11, and they asked a man on the street in New York, this is war. We've been attacked. This is war. And I remember kind of laughing. I go, well, th- that guy's an idiot. War, th- this is terrorism. They got us. They got us with our, you know, our guard was down. They got us. There's no war. There's no country to bomb after 9-11. This sure is as hell didn't stop them. And stop them bombing countries after 9-11. I remember thinking, there's no, no, we got hit, you know. But we'll find out who did it, and maybe we can bring them to justice, but we got hit. We immediately went to, this is war, and I'm watching <laughs> people react to the, the smoke, the blankets of smoke from Canada. And I, the reaction of some Americans is they, they cannot make the connection. They refuse to make the connection that this is fossil fuels. No, it's Canada. You know, Canada isn't raking leaves. Blame Canada. Yeah. Blame Canada. And, and I thought, how many Americans believe that? How many Americans believe that the smoke is Canada's fault? And... What do we do with these Americans? What do we do? We put them in the arms industry. <laughs> right, the right kind of people. Well, I thought this is what wars were invented for. The, the, yeah. There's your fodder right there. I got yeah. your I got your cannon fodder right there. What are you reading this week? What am I reading? Yeah. Uh, mostly my emails. You're not reading a book? I am. I forgot the title of it. Uh, it's about women comedians, actually. I, I, I feel terrible that I forgot the title. Uh, um, yeah, and it's great. It's great. It's it's about all these really great women and their journeys in comedy and the impact that they made and what they fought against. And uh, I'll have to send you a photo of it. So I, I can't I can't think of the title right now. I don't know why. I don't know what's going on with my memory. <laughs> does pot, what does pot do to you? I haven't smoked pot uh, since before you were born. What does it do to Does it make you sharper? It keeps you from killing others. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you, indica or sativa? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever the, whatever's handy. 
Hell, I started smoking pot when I was 40. I never smoked pot my whole life until I was 40. Doug Benson didn't smoke until he was 30. Wasn't it Greg Proops who handed Doug Benson his first joint? I don't know, but that was momentous. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You had never touched a joint until you were 40. Correct. You had tried it, though. No. The only time I ever I ever tried it was uh, I, I had inadvertently eaten edibles uh, the night before my college graduation. I was at a party and I was eating cookies and I ate a bunch of cookies because I, I, I didn't really get it. And uh, uh, that was the only time. And, and I would assume you had a bad reaction. Edibles are kind of. Uh, I don't remember it. So uh, so it was something intense. But um, and, and no, I, never, I went through the whole I still to this day, I've never touched cocaine. I went through the whole comedy boom of the 80s being offered my pay in green or white by club owners. Uh, and I never, never touched it. I'm, I'm not a real big drug guy. Uh, um, but uh, the reason I started smoking pot at 40 was because I realized that um, I, I was a bit of a control freak. And I felt that it was keeping me from reaching certain levels of creativity that being so it's so in control and, and 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 doing so much work to have everything figured out uh had served me so well for so long but i felt like it was it was now in my way so uh um i did a bunch of things like you know jumping out of planes and stuff like that and 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 one of the things was smoking pot stick, like, you know because that's one of the reasons why i never did anything so i was doing stand-up from the age of 16 or something actually literally 17 i was already making i was making you know money doing stand-up uh, and so um uh i didn't want anything to get in the way of my focus right but then i was feeling like well this is a really simple way to not be you know completely controlling about what i'm thinking and feeling at any given moment uh, so, uh, you know, why should I be afraid? And, uh, that's, that's why I decided at the age of 40 to start smoking. Interesting. Paul, yeah. P- Paul Provenza is a, yes, sir. is a so, brilliant comedian and director. And you can watch him June 17th, the green room. How do people buy tickets? Go to nowherecomedy.com. Uh, and just put, just look for the date, June 17th, for the Doug Stanhope, Andy Andrus, Paul Provenza extravaganza green room live. I told my kid about this, with my kid who lives in L.A. I think he and his girlfriend want to come. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send them. They can come yeah. to my house. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing is it's all... The live show is, is all invited. It's just personal guests because it, it's my house. It's not a club, you know. Um, but Do you know that like- my, thanks to Green Room on Showtime, my kids came to all the recording sessions. I took them I, out of school. Did you really? That's yes. a fine pay- they, right they My son sat with Jonathan Winters for about two hours. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was that was amazing for me to sit with Jonathan Winters for a couple hours. Right. Holy crap. Was, holy crap. And you know what? He was 85 years old and still dealing with his father issues. It's, it was so revealing to me that some a genius of his caliber still would like they, I, I didn't have a single conversation with him at any point over the couple of years that I had been friends with him before he passed away where his father didn't come up in some way. And, right. and it was really, it really was like, wow, I better resolve my shit or it's never going to end. You know? Right, right. We, hey, and you, uh, you and Pasternak are doing a podcast? We did a podcast. We're, uh, we're done with it right now. It was only 10 episodes we did for Comedy Dynamics. Uh, you interviewed John Cleese. Uh, we did, uh, we did a, a piece with John Cleese. Uh, we did the, um, this is interesting because, um, Dan Pasternak had a recording from when he was a kid. He recorded an interview from, I mean, he must've been like 12 years old, recorded an interview with Mel Blanc. So we, wow. got, we, we got the guy who is now doing all the Warner Brothers voices 
or most of them, not not all of them, uh, who was a Mel Blanc freak. Right. And we played the Mel Blanc stuff for him on right. the podcast. And he's interesting because he's a really he's a Filipino Canadian guy. And it just became this thing about how, how did he end up doing this? Right. And, it, you know, and it became like comedy being a universal, you know, like music. If it's if it's your thing, it's your thing. It right. doesn't matter where, what, when, how. Right. You know? Mel Blanc is a and, really interesting guy. Somebody told me, I won't mention his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Eric Bowser. But, uh, but somebody told me, uh, somebody who worked in uh, the same field that Mel Blanc did, for people who don't know, Mel Blanc invented Barney Rubble, uh, All the Warner Brothers Bugs characters. Bunny, Porky Pig. Uh, I mean, the guy. You name it, all of them. Yeah. And when he asked for money, you know, they didn't pay him enough. But it, it got to a point where they needed him. And when he died... uh, An order came down, I guess, from Hanna-Barbera and Warner Brothers. We will never allow ourselves to be in a position where one person could command that much power from us. That they they broke up all the... They they never wanted a, a superstar like Mel Blanc again who could hold them up for money. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That doesn't surprise so, me. So, so you have somebody. If a, if a genius comes along, yeah, the stu- don't don't fuck yourself up. <laughs> the studio says he's good, she's good, but let's not be beholden to one person again. That can cost a lot of money. Well, having said that, though, when uh, you know when he was doing the Flintstones, he in in the middle of that run, he had a uh, um, a terrible, terrible car accident, and he would confined to his bed for really I, I think a couple of years and they actually built a recording studio around his bed really and all the actors would come in and they had all the mics set up and they recorded all the Flintstone dialogue from his sick bed I didn't know that yeah. interesting yeah all right Paul Provenza come back next week I have a life man no you yeah. don't no no this is okay we'll, right. we'll talk I love you, buddy. How how do people contact you? Plug your gig one more Uh, time. uh, uh, What's that? Plug your gig one more time. Yeah, June 17th, the Green Room Live uh, on Nowhere Comedy. Just go to at Nowhere Comedy or NowhereComedy.com and buy your tickets. It's it's like 10 bucks or something. It's nothing. Um, And you'll see a great show because these are five unbelievably funny people and they, they... they talk about some. They really talk about weird, being. They they talk about a, some really dark stuff. Do you know Do you know Christine Levine? No. Oh, you should know her. She's terrific. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. So that'll be a fun a fun night and a, and another green room. So I was going to say you I was, come I, in because we project we project the audience on on the uh, fence. Oh really? Bed. Yeah yeah yeah. So uh, we interact with them, and you put you project the Zoom audience up on the fa- yeah. that's yeah, genius on the, next to the stage. Yeah, so you should pop in and be um, tell me, Phil, Phil comedian David Feldman is back. Well, you, I, I don't know if I should repeat what my son and I wanted. I, t- I, t- I texted you my idea, which oh about about uh, doing the pro. No, 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 just to give the other side of the story from a, di- a different perspective. I love it. <laughs> it just, it's, you know, 20 years ago, that, that could have been that could have been funny. Uh, all right. I'll try to get you back next week. Thank you. All right, brother. Okay. Hey, thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.